Welcome to the State Bar of Texas podcast, your monthly source for conversations and curated content to improve your law practice with your host, Rocky Deer. Well, hello and welcome to the State Bar of Texas podcast brought to you in partnership with Legal Talk Network. This is Rocky Deer here at the 2018 State Bar of Texas annual meeting in Houston. You hear that buzz in the background? That's what that is. That is the annual meeting underway. You know, I learned this morning that I am now an official adult and I'm going to tell you why I'm an official adult. You know, you're a grown up when you get to call professors by their first name. It's the coolest thing ever. So I've got with me here today, Professor Joe Crispino, but I get to call him Joe because we're good like that, aren't we, Joe? Absolutely, Rocky. That's what I'm talking about. So Joe has written a very interesting book. Now, this is the State Bar of Texas annual meeting, but you're not a lawyer, Joe, are you? I am not a lawyer, no. But you've written this book on, on a topic that almost every lawyer seems to devour and love. You know, every, every lawyer I know, it's all about To Kill a Mockingbird. So many lawyers were, mm-hmm. were influenced by that book. Yep. You've written a book that I think a lot of lawyers will enjoy. Do you want to tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, it's called Atticus Finch, The Biography. Oh. And one of the things I should definitely tell the lawyers here in Texas is that, uh, yes, I do realize that Atticus Finch is not a real person. <laughs> uh, I think that's important to keep in mind. Well, he's a fictional character, but I think I've, I've heard somewhere that he was based on, on Harper Lee's actual father. That's true. Harper Lee talked at the time of the book's publication, and when the movie came out, the book was published in 1960. Sure. It was made into a movie in 1962. The Gregory Peck one. We've all seen it, right? That's right. That's right. And she talked about how Her father was not exactly Atticus, but was the inspiration, uh, kind of inspired her to come up with the character, that they shared a similar kind of disposition. That was the the word she used. So the case that we see in To Kill a Mockingbird, black man wrongfully accused of murder. Yeah. Was that an actual story or was that story fictional, but Atticus Finch and who he is, was kind of inspired by her father. Can you tell us at Interplay? Yeah, there was no trial like the one that took place in the book that was exactly parallel to the experience of her father. Her father's name is Amasa Coleman Lee. He did do uh, some criminal work early in his career where he represented two black men who were actually executed. Uh, they, oh, wow. they had killed, uh, accused of killing a, a white man. and um, But he didn't really do a lot of criminal work. I mean, he did mostly just kind of wills and estates and just kind of work around town. One of the things that I found that helps us understand Harper Lee's father a lot better is to realize that like Atticus Finch, he was a small town lawyer and a state legislator. But he was also the owner and the operator, the editor for 18 years of the local newspaper, the Monroe Journal. Okay. He edited that for 18 years from 1929 to 1947. And okay. I went back and I read all of those old newspapers. And in a small town newspaper from that era, there was no guarantee that, you know, the editor would have a regular editorial page, you know, where he's lay- laying out his opinions and that sort of thing. But I went back and I looked and it was remarkable because not only did A.C. Lee have an, an editorial page every week, but it was an active and ambitious editorial page. And so I read all 18 years worth of his newspapers and those editorials, and I was able to kind of reconstruct his political worldview through the 1930s and 1940s and to see kind of how that might have impacted Harper Lee and her view of him. Do you think his political worldview was similar to that of Atticus Finch from what you read? Well, it depends, Rocky, on which Atticus Finch you're talking about, right? One of the things that makes this book possible to write a biography of Atticus Finch is the fact that we have the publication in 2015 of this other novel, right? Ghost Set of Watchmen, Mm -hmm. which was discovered in a, a security deposit box and in Monroeville, Alabama, published in 2015. And it presented this very different view of the character of Atticus Finch. Okay, tell us about that. So in Ghost of a Watchman, what happens is it's the, it's the same characters in both novels. And one of the things I've been able to, to show in my research is that Harper Lee imagined them as the same characters as part of a broader narrative arc. So it's the same characters. You have Atticus and you have the adult Jean Louise, the, you know, the adult scout. Okay. And Jean Louise comes back from New York to her hometown. And while she's there, 
uh, something very dramatic happens. She realizes that her beloved, kind, wouldn't hurt a ground squirrel father has joined up with the Citizens Councils. This organization of resistance of the civil rights movement and the dictates of the Supreme Court and the Brown decision. So Atticus in that situation has gone completely the opposite way. Well, Atticus is exactly the way you would think a 70-year-old arthritic Alabama, white man in Alabama would be in 1956 or 57, right? He's opposed to the civil rights movement. He has these very paternalistic uh, racial views, and, and he's resentful about the changes that are taking place in his native region. And that's how Harper Lee's father was as well? Well, what's interesting about Harper Lee's father is, and you go back and you read those editorials, is that we see evidence, there's evidence clearly there for both views of Atticus. Both the ideal uh, figure in To Kill a Mockingbird, the defender of the downtrodden, the defender of the jury system, the man who stood up against mob rule when he protected Tom Robinson against the lynch mob that came. But you also see how she could be inspired to write the figure in Go Set a Watchman, the racist reactionary figure. Because over the course of the 1930s and 40s, A.C. Lee is changing as the civil rights movement is emerging, as dramatic social, cultural changes are coming to the South. So you really see inspiration for both of the characters. I think this raises an interesting question. So when we look back on the prism of history and we look back at people from that era, I think there's, there's a tendency for us to say, oh, my gosh, that was so people were either racist or they were not racist. They were either pro-civil rights or anti-civil rights. And the picture that you're painting seems a bit more complicated and maybe more, a bit more in-depth. You've got people that, that want to protect the rights of the individual, but maybe don't believe in civil rights on a macro-racial level. Is that... Yeah, absolutely. And that would be a good description of A.C. Lee, her father. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Now, now, how did you get into this particular topic? Let's get into your background a little bit. So you're, you're a professor. Yeah. A history professor, not a lawyer. That's right. That's okay. right. Very important. Well, congratulations. And, you know... If you could see Joe right now, he looks very well rested and not at all stressed out. So you can tell he's not a lawyer, right? He looks very, very happy. You seem to be very happy with what you do. Yeah. So, and you teach at Emory University. Right, Emory University in Atlanta. I'm a professor of of 20th century American political history. So a lot of my work has been about the history of the South and its transition from the Jim Crow era into the modern era. So I write about the history of the South really from the 1930s or so through the, the 20th century. And my other books have been kind of more straightforward works of political history. But when I think about that period, yeah. there is this one kind of cultural production that looms so large in our, the way that we think about and understand uh, what was at stake in the Jim Crow South. And, and that's To Kill a Mockingbird, you know, both the, the book and the movie. And so I've, I've long been fascinated by the book and the movie. Mm-hmm. And wanting to, to write about it. The other part of it is kind of personal, too. I come from the Deep South. I'm, I'm from a very small town in Mississippi, Macon, M-A-C-O-N. It sounds a lot like oh, Macon, Macon, Georgia. No, it's Macon, Mississippi. Mason, Macon, Mississippi. Yeah, yeah. So I heard Which is Ma- much smaller, about 2,300 people. Now, do you guys have, like, a baseball team? Because Macon, Georgia has a baseball team. They do. And they it's do. called Macon Whoopi, apparently. <laughs> they're called, that's, that's the name of the team. I'm not making it up. It's, they're called the Macon Whoopi. I mean, <laughs> don't blame me for that. But. Yeah. We don't have a baseball team in Macon, Mississippi. So no Macon Whoopi in, We're in no your Macon. part. Uh, there may be some Macon Whoopi, but there's no but baseball th- team. But not, not as a baseball team. Right, and, right, you know, right. fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. So what you're saying here kind of brings up a couple of questions to me. First and foremost, do you find that the college age men and women of today find Harper Lee's story to be relevant to their experiences, or do they think of that as too far in the distant past, number one? Number two, a lot of lawyers seem to really idolize the story of Atticus Finch, and a lot of them drew inspiration for their legal careers when becoming lawyers. They said, oh, well, look at Atticus Finch. But then when we see To Set a Watchman, that paints a very different picture, or at least it paints a deeper picture of him. So do you think that our understanding and sort of the cultural understanding of To Kill a Mockingbird needs to change. So is it still relevant to kids today? And do you think that our understanding growing up has to change and be amended based on what you've read in To Set a Watchman? Well, I definitely think that the genie is out of the bottle with Atticus Finch, right? In the sense that we know now from the archives and from this other work that Harper Lee was really struggling to make sense of 
her father's kind of political heritage, mm. her father's kind of conservatism at a time in Southern history in the late 1950s. That's when she's writing both of these novels mm -hmm. from 1957, 58, and 59. At a time when of great political tumult in the South where there are reactionary kind of right-wing forces coming to the fore in Southern politics. And so she's trying to make sense of her father's conservative kind of principled political perspective in the midst of this kind of right-wing reactionary politics. So it's, it's, I think that's what my book tells, which is very important. Now, will To Kill a Mockingbird still be assigned to eighth graders and ninth graders? I hope so, right? Because that's still a book that's a wonderful story, beautifully told, that students can read and think about kind of fundamental issues of tolerance and empathy in a multiracial democracy and how important those are. So I hope that people can still continue to read To Kill a Mockingbird and, and are signed To Kill a Mockingbird. But I want them to read my book afterwards. When they get to college, <laughs> I think they should read my book. Sure. And I think they should read my book and understand the broader context in which Harper Lee was writing that book and what she was struggling to try to achieve. So in your view, and in your experience, when you look back, you know, we, we hear stories from the 1950s and 60s during the whole civil rights era. You know, we hear stories of those who were resisting the change towards civil rights. And then you also read about people like Harper Lee, who really questioned that, even though they might have been part of an order in which there was separation of whites from people of color. And now we're seeing that there were people back then who were white, but were resisting that. Have you figured out or have, do, you, do you have any theories as to what inspired whites in the South to resist the established order and be in favor of these changes towards civil rights? And the reason I ask that is, I wonder if we can learn something for today's audience about how it is that we interpret the world around us and how do we think critically and how do we get young people to think critically and maybe question the norms that are, that are prevailing in, in whatever time they live in. Has your work kind of given you a, a hypothesis or a theory about that? I don't have a theory about it. You know, historians don't have theories. Social scientists have theories. <laughs> historians you sound have, like a lawyer. Historians <laughs> have evidence. Histo like, like lawyers, okay. historians have evidence. Okay. And we go back and we look at the evidence. And what okay. history always tends to show us is that it's a lot more complicated than we remember. Hmm. And that our power to remember what happens is very weak. Hmm. And we need archival evidence and we need historical arguments to remind us about what was at stake and what was going on and how complicated. And what seems obvious to us today was not at all obvious to the people who were living through it. And I think when we understand that, we can have a bit more empathy for those who came before us uh, and the struggles that they had. So in terms of how did Harper Lee kind of see beyond the boundaries of her society and the kinds of lessons that she was supposed to learn as a white woman in the Jim Crow South in the 1930s and 40s. I think she learned it through reading. You know, I think she learned it through her own kind of self-education and realizing there's a bigger world out there beyond Monroeville, Alabama. But it's important to understand too that Harper Lee was not some kind of crusader. She was herself ambivalent about some of the changes that were taking place in her home. And that's one of the things that, that I talk about in my book as well. So your book does explore Harper Lee and her own, her own journey through these issues. Absolutely. Wow. So it's called Atticus Finch, A Biography. Yep. Because even though he was a fictional character, he was based on, on a person and on people from that time period. No, it's kind of a, it's a bit of a cheeky title. Atticus Finch is a fictional character. Right. But it's a kind of cultural and political history about how the character was created, how it changed over time, you know, both from, the, from Ghosts of the Watchmen to To Kill a Mockingbird to the adaptation where Horton Foote, a great Texan, wrote the adaptation and changed the character of Atticus in subtle but important ways to, to when Gregory Peck embodied him and changed Horton Foote's script in certain ways and, uh, and on to the reception of the book and the novel and, the, and, the, and this critical kind of high watermark of the Southern Civil Rights Movement. Wow. These are still relevant issues even all these many years later. It's, it's fascinating. Well, Joe, it's been a pleasure having you on here. Now, if somebody wants to get a hold of you, because I know there's, our listeners will be interested in learning more, 
What's the best way for them to reach out? I think the best way to do it would be to go to www.basicbooks.com. Okay. And that is my publisher, Basic Books, and you'll see there the uh, the book and, and other information about it. And are you on Twitter or LinkedIn? Or I'm on Twitter, yes. I'm on Twitter, Joseph Crespino. Okay. And I uh, would love to hear from folks. And I guess they can also find you on Emory University's website. You Absolutely, in the history department at Emory University. And your email address is? J-C-R-E-S-P-I at emory.edu. Awesome. So if you're listening and if you're interested in this, you know, this is a huge issue. I, I'm looking forward to reading this book. And right. so I'm, I'm going to get myself a copy of this. And if you want to if you want to see Joe in person, be sure and get onto YouTube, type in State Bar of Texas, and you'll find an in-person interview on Texas Bar TV. And so you'll be able to see Joe in person. You'll be able to, to hear a little bit more about his story. But thank you so much for joining us here today. You know, State Bar of Texas annual meeting is always just an amazing place to be. And you can hear the excitement and the buzz in the background. I hope you guys will make it out for next year's annual meeting. But in the meantime, this is Rocky Deer with the latest edition of the State Bar of Texas podcast. In partnership with Legal Talk Network, I want to thank our guest, Joe Crispino, for joining us. And if you like what you heard today, please find us, rate us in Apple Podcasts, or using your favorite podcast app. Again, thank you for being here. We'll talk to you soon, and we hope you enjoyed this trip because life's a journey, folks. Tune in. If you'd like more information about today's show, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Go to TexasBar.com slash podcasts. Subscribe via Apple Podcasts and RSS. Find both the State Bar of Texas and Legal Talk Network on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Or download the free app from Legal Talk Network in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, the State Bar of Texas, Legal Talk Network, or their respective officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, or subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.